Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Fulton, the director of the Kinder Institute. I'll be your moderator today. Um, the Kinder Institute Urban Reads series showcases recently published books by regional and national urban experts, and we're thrilled today to have with us uh, Rachel Kimbrough, who is the Dean of the School of Social Sciences here at Rice and the author of the just published book about life after Harvey in Houston, Hurricane Harvey, uh, called In Too Deep. Generous support for, uh, the, uh, for the Kinder Institute comes from a multi-year grant from Houston Endowment. The Institute relies on philanthropic investments from many other contributors, including Nancy and Rich Kinder and the Kinder Foundation, Laura and Tom Bacon, the Baxter Trust, Chevron, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, Wells Fargo, the William T. Grant Foundation, Bank of America, PNC Bank, the Spencer Foundation, Claire and Eric Anya, Arnold Ventures, Bracewell, LLP, Centerpoint Energy, Catherine and Hank Coleman, HEB, Sis and Hasty Johnson, uh, Becky and Ralph O'Connor, the United Way of Greater Houston, and Billy Naya Carrara and Associates. And now I'd like to introduce Rachel uh, uh, Kimbrough, who is our presenter for today. Hello, Rachel. Sitting there in, in your office in Craft Hall and the Rice Campus, I don't think you're literally right beneath me, but it's close. Yes. <laughs> you are one floor down from me right as we speak today. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Rachel Kimbrough is a distinguished sociologist. She's a professor of sociology here at Rice. She is the dean of the School of Social Sciences at Rice, and she is the former director of the Kinder Institute's uh, Urban Health Program. Her research focuses on family and neighborhood influences on child and well-being, and that's very much what the book is about. Um, uh, uh, and the book explores the role of mothers, family, and community resiliency in the wake of repeated flood disasters. Uh, that's something that we here in Houston know all too much about, uh, including Rachel herself, I believe. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. She'll do a presentation. And as I say, um, when she's, while she's presenting, if you'd like to uh, put a question in the Q&A box that we can pose to her afterwards, please do so. Um, if you like one of the questions, you can uh, like it and it'll go up the list. So I'll turn it over to Rachel now. Uh, good afternoon and thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Bill. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today and to talk to this great group about my new book, which has just come out. I'm going to begin today with a story. On a sweltering fall afternoon in Houston, in 2007. Nicole was walking back to her car after working as an assistant in an art class at a local community center. She and her husband Dave had recently sold their bungalow near downtown for three times what they paid for it a decade ago. Now they were looking for a place with less traffic for their young son to play and eventually ride his bike. Nicole decided to drive through the neighborhood near the community center called Bayou Oaks which she knew to be, a, to be safe and with a great location not too far from the central city. As she drove, the place called to her. It looked like a real neighborhood with wide sidewalks and mature oak trees without being all the way out in Houston's far flung suburbs. The homes were a mix of unassuming ranch houses and larger homes. The big homes would be out of their price range but because of the extraordinary appreciation of their starter home, now they could afford a ranch house in Bayou Oaks. As she drove home, Nicole knew she had found her neighborhood. She just had to let Dave know. It was exactly what they were looking for. A great location, good school, and quiet leafy streets where their son would one day ride his bike freely. It was the opposite of their current traffic-ridden neighborhood near downtown, but it was still close enough to the city amenities they valued like museums and art galleries and restaurants. 10 years later, when I spoke with Nicole after Harvey flooded their home, she still felt the same way. Her gut instinct that day, just driving around, had been right. Floods or no floods, Bayou Oaks was still the perfect neighborhood to raise a family and they weren't going anywhere. Nicole, like many mothers, took responsibility for curating her family's lives. She was the logistics manager, the parenting expert, and the guardian of stability in precarious economic times. Flooded is the story of what happens 
when carefully curated lives in one affluent neighborhood in Southwest Houston are threatened by the ravages of climate change? Will these families of means uproot their lives and move their families to safer ground? Or will they dig in and stay determined to outwit mother nature? Hurricane Harvey made landfall as a cat four about 10 p.m. on August 24th near Port Aransas, Texas. Its movement slowed to a crawl and deadly rain pounded Texas and especially Houston for more than three days straight. The unending rain ended up dumping more than 50 inches on some parts of Houston. More than half of homes in Houston sustained some damage from the storm and 60% of those homes were not in any type of floodplain. Houston, of course, is no stranger to flooding. It's, quote, bayous, glorified drainage ditches, snake through the city, mostly serving their purpose of draining Houston's frequent rainstorms. But the 72-hour deluge from Hurricane Harvey was like nothing ever witnessed, and the bayous were not built to withstand 50 inches of rain. For days, Houstonians were trapped in their houses, or, if their homes flooded, on neighbors' second stories. Harvey was an equal opportunity flood in one sense. High and low socioeconomic status neighborhoods were flooded across the city. Of course, the recovery process was not equal opportunity. For Bayou Oaks, Hurricane Harvey felt like deja vu. Flooding, which is now the most common natural disaster, is one major aspect of climate change that is on the rise in the United States and around the world. Over time, these unprecedented rainfall events are expected to occur with greater frequency and floods along with other types of natural, quote, disasters like wildfires are expected to become a reality for more and more parts of the world. But for Bayou Oaks, the chronic disaster future has already arrived. Although I can't take you through the whole book today, of course, I want to walk you through the story of Bayou Oaks and focus in on a few key findings as I go. So first, I will tell you a little bit about the history of Bayou Oaks. I'm sure you're wondering, where is Bayou Oaks? Bayou Oaks is a pseudonym for the actual neighborhood, and this is meant to protect the privacy of my respondents in the story. The Bayou Oaks neighborhood in Southwest Houston was opened with fanfare in 1955 with a ribbon cutting by no other than then Vice President Richard Nixon. The new homes, which we would now call mid-century moderns, ranged from a modest 1,500 square foot three bedroom to a 4,000 square foot five bedroom. The lots were large with manicured lawns and studded with live oaks. Wide sidewalks led to the neighborhood school and park. An ad in the Houston Chronicle in 1955 beckoned residents with the lines. You want to be sure this time Sure that your children will go to the right schools, play with the right companions. Sure that you will live in the right kind of neighborhood. Bayou Oaks offers this assurance. Soon, residents flocked to the brand new neighborhood, about a 15 minute drive to downtown or the medical center, drawn by the promised good schools, decent commutes, and yes, as part of white flight from the central core of the city. Since its founding, for residents of Bayou Oaks who lived within a block or two of the bayou, occasionally getting water in their sunken living room was just a part of life. It was a trade-off they accepted for the chance to live in a coveted neighborhood with a central location, great schools, and attractive older homes. The Memorial Day flood of 2015, however, was different. The bayou's reach spread far south of the homes adjacent to its banks. About half of the Bayou Oaks homes zoned to Bayou Oaks Elementary flooded. The school itself took on just a little water in an outlying building, but was largely spared. Shaken but determined to persevere, the majority of families in 2015 decided to renovate and stay in Bayou Oaks. Memorial Day was a fluke, unprecedented, unlikely to happen again. Then came the tax day flood of April 2016 which affected a much smaller number of homes, but rattled the neighborhood more. Was this going to keep happening? Some reflooded families had only just completed their renovations from the Memorial Day flood. Some of these families decided they'd had enough after two floods. 
but most stayed. The neighborhood rebuilt again. Then, 16 months later, came Hurricane Harvey. As I drove my children back to Houston from Central Texas, where we'd evacuated, leaving my husband at home to deal with potential home flooding, I tried to hold back tears. We didn't live in Bayou Oaks, but we lived in a neighborhood to the west that was much less expensive and, ironically, on higher ground. Our children attended Bayou Oaks Elementary, though, through the luck of Houston's magnet lottery system, so the repeatedly flooded residents in Bayou Oaks were our school acquaintances. For each of the prior two floods, we had helped muck out homes. Although Harvey's floodwaters lapped at our foundation, we were spared the indignity of its invasion into our own home. I knew with a certainty that I have rarely felt in my career that I had to begin to craft a research project. The world needed to know the story of Bayou Oaks because it was on the front lines of climate change and because I had witnessed what the flood experience did to a family. Everything was shut down for almost eight days in Houston after Harvey. While my husband and children mucked out homes and I hosted the Kimbrough daycare and taqueria for flooded Bayou Oaks children, I started to plan my research design. My goal was to speak to the mothers of school-aged children within the borders of Bayou Oaks, again, a pseudonym for the neighborhood, about their flood experience. I first spoke to these mothers within the first eight weeks after Hurricane Harvey, and then again a year later in the fall of 2018 for a total of 72 interviews. This longitudinal approach, and that just means following up at multiple points in time, allowed me to collect the mother's flood stories when they were fresh, but also see how they were faring again a year later. Although I knew five of the mothers that I interviewed before starting the project, I'd only been inside one of their homes before Harvey. At the end of my initial interviews, I asked mothers to refer me to two other mothers in the neighborhood who probably didn't know each other. This is a common way to recruit participants in sociological research. I also purposefully recruited mothers in each flood experience category. So first timers, 19, second timers, 12, and then I had five mothers in my study who had flooded all three times in three years. 30 of the 36 mothers were white and the others were black, Latino, and Asian. Their age ranged from 32 to 55. All but one were college educated and all 36 were initially in heterosexual partnered relationships. 33 of those were married. The family's incomes ranged a lot from $75,000 to more than $400,000 and their home's pre-Harvey values ranged from about $350,000 to more than $600,000. Two-thirds of the mothers in my study worked outside the home, most of them full-time, and the rest identified as stay-at-home mothers. In addition to the interviews, many mothers wrote me emails or text messages in the intervening months to update me on their progress, and some sent me photos as well. I reached out to those that I hadn't heard from. These efforts allowed me to keep tabs on each family's progress throughout the year so I could trace the trajectory of how they were doing. So together, the two rounds of interviews provide an in-depth look at life after a disaster and identify the mechanisms working to hold the mothers to their community, the impact of disasters on their families, and the strategies and schemas they draw on during the work of recovery and by which they're measuring success or failure. Every interview was professionally transcribed and then openly coded. I'm happy to talk more about the methods in the Q&A, but I want to spend most of my time talking to you about the findings. As I began the project, I had several research questions in mind. First, I wanted to explore how intensive mothering, which I'll say more about in a minute, would fare under stress. I wanted to understand the financial and social resources that affluent families had access to as they were recovering from a flood. I was also interested in how experiencing a flood and the recovery process would impact the mother's mental, physical, and marital well being. And then finally, the big question I wanted to know would they stay or would they go? And if they plan to stay, what would they do to adapt their homes? In the talk today, I will primarily focus on the mother's efforts to restore their homes, but I will touch on the other questions briefly. 
overall, the book's main argument is that the careful choice of neighborhood and school is an overlooked component of intensive mothering and modern parenting, and that the consequences of trying to maintain very high parenting standards after a disaster takes a really big toll on mothers in particular. As the guardians of stability, the mothers are digging in, trying to keep social, emotional, and economic instability at bay during this year after experiencing the flood. And ultimately, the mothers justify their choice to stay in Bayou Oaks as being for their children. And we'll dig into that more. The book argues that the mother's neighborhood attachment is so powerful because Bayou Oaks fit a series of very precise criteria the mothers had about where to raise their families in this enormous, enormous turbulent city with the right kind of neighbors and school being primary. I situate this project at the intersection of work on intensive mothering, economic and parental anxiety, and the work that exists already on gendered labor after a disaster. So intensive mothering is a child rearing logic that centers the child's experiences, draws on expert advice, and is time and money intensive. This kind of parenting is common among middle-class and affluent families, particularly, I would argue, in a time of economic insecurity. And while fathers, of course, are increasingly part of the intensive parenting mindset, most of the labor associated with this style of parenting still falls to mothers. The book also argues that the mother's choice of Bayou Oaks initially was a way to gain security for their family life in insecure times. And finally, the book focuses on affluent families for whom intensive parenting is most salient, but it also offers a relatively unique way of looking at a disaster. Most of the existing literature on disasters, for very good reasons, focuses on lower socioeconomic populations. But we don't know a lot about how affluent households respond to a disaster, and especially to chronic disaster. As climate change intensifies across the globe, we will need a stronger understanding of its impacts on all types of communities, as well as how the affluent consolidate resources after a disaster. In the end, 28 of the 36 mothers that I interviewed decided to stay in Bayou Oaks after Harvey. That is, after the Memorial Day, Tax Day, and Harvey floods, three and three years, they wanted to stay. And the book's central question is why? To understand why mothers largely chose to stay in Bayou Oaks, we first have to understand why they chose it in the first place. For this group of mostly white, upper middle class mothers, this was the ideal neighborhood in which to raise a family. Mothers frequently mention several features that led them to choose this lifestyle in this neighborhood. First, they valued the close in location of the neighborhood, rejecting the long commutes and homogeneity of the suburbs. Next, they lauded the people who lived in Bayou Oaks, distinguishing them both from suburbanites and from the wealthier residents in two nearby communities. And most importantly, the mothers valued Bayou Oaks Elementary as the place that would educate their children. The mothers believed that the qualities Bayou Oaks offered were unique in this fourth largest city in the country. Houston is an unusual city in many ways, but one distinctive feature is that the lack of zoning and rapid growth of the city has led to urban sprawl across more than 10,000 square miles, larger than the state of New Jersey. You can drive an hour and a half and still be in Houston. Suburban commutes on the city's notorious freeways can top two hours a day with an average of about 50 minutes. The Bayou Oaks mothers were not interested in commuting. The extra time they envisioned would be family time as described by Laura, a 42 year old stay at home mother of two. And so with this choice in this location, it meant that my husband was gonna be home for dinner and actually spend a few hours with everyone. And you know, the trade-offs were a smaller home at a higher price point, but we felt like what we were getting for that, it was more than worth it. And we really valued diversity and culture. So their selection of the neighborhood was a value statement about themselves, but they also wanted to live around other people with the same values. And that meant not living in the suburbs. 
When I asked the mothers why they chose Bayou Oaks as a place for their family life, they were not shy about telling me about the neighborhoods they rejected. While many found nearby wealthier neighborhoods to be, quote, snobby, they also did not find the idea of living outside the city in its vast suburbs appealing. They considered themselves to be sophisticated urban women, and city living was a fundamental part of their identities. Almost to a person, the mothers emphatically rejected the idea of living in the suburbs, many telling me some version of the following, assuming I would know what they meant. Well, we're definitely not suburbs people. The mothers felt that the suburbs weren't just a place to live, they were an embodiment of a particular type of person that they did not want to be. Instead, they were city people who embraced the world of urban life with all of its diversity and action. This symbolic boundary between city people and suburbs people then was a critical part of the mother's identities and they put themselves squarely in the urban camp. Even more than the benefits for themselves of living in Bayou Oaks, the mothers value the ability to raise their children in an urban environment. As Michelle, 43, mother of two put it, we have all types of people, right? So like we do have like Muslims and we have black people and Hispanic people and Asian people and Indian people. And you know, I love that about our neighborhood. While technically this statement is accurate, it is important to note that Bayou Oaks is 85% non-Hispanic white according to the census. As in other studies of mostly white neighborhoods, the mothers consistently overestimated the diversity of their neighbors. While the neighborhood itself was less diverse than they believed, the neighborhood school was actually racially and ethnically diverse, with a student body which roughly mirrored Houston's race eth ethnic composition among younger populations. So about 30% white, 30% Black, and 30% Latino, and 10% Asian. About one third of the school's population was economically disadvantaged. For many of the mothers, the primary motivation for selecting Bayou Oaks was its elementary school. Like other families, the Bayou Oaks parents viewed their decision about where to live as intricately linked to their decision about where their children should go to school. In Houston, children can attend their neighborhood school or they can enter a lottery to attend one of dozens of specialized magnet schools. While intended to offer low-income students opportunities to attend higher performing schools, in many urban areas, school choice has brought the greatest benefits to the most affluent students. Because most magnet schools in Houston also have attendance zones, the result is a two-tiered system of admissions in which families who can afford to own or rent a home in a particular attendance zone can essentially purchase a seat for their child at a particular school, bypassing the magnet lottery. Like other affluent parents, the Bayou Oaks parents were adept at navigating bureaucracies to benefit their families, especially in the school choice environment. They viewed the choice of where their children would attend school as something they could and should manage and control. While not all of the mothers in the study were white, the white mothers mentioned diversity most frequently as something valuable that Bayou Oaks Elementary offered. They believed that their choice of Bayou Oaks Elementary was a distinctly countercultural signal. Other sociologists have documented this phenomenon in other large cities. Choosing a particular school for these parents is an important statement of their identities as liberal urbanites who defiantly choose to stay in the city and send their children to urban public schools. I asked Nicole why it was important to her that her kids be exposed to children from other backgrounds. Because they need to know what the real world is like. Bayou Oaks Elementary is real world. And Houston to me is real world, even though it's still segregated. I'm not saying it's totally integrated, but I want them to grow up knowing that there are other people that are like them, but don't look like them. So that's something that's really important to me. But the appropriate amount of diversity their children experienced was something the mothers believed was important to precisely calibrate. The choice of Bayou Oaks allowed the families to live among other affluent, mostly white neighbors, but send their children to a school that had a diverse community. For them, it was the best of both worlds, walking a balance. They believed that understanding different types of people and being able to get along with them was a critical advantage in life that they were providing their children. But there were limits. As one mother put it, we want to expose them to reality, just not too real. The Bayou Oaks mothers then believed they had a lot to lose by contemplating leaving the neighborhood after Harvey. 
they'd found a needle in the haystack, something that met all of their criteria about where to raise their children. Before I discuss the reasons mothers gave for staying in the community after Harvey, I want to briefly give you a glimpse into what the flood was like. So now I'll start with another story. Amy, 36, a part-time freelance writer with springy brunette curls, put her three small children to bed together in the same bedroom as Harvey approached. She could tell the kids were keying off her anxiety that evening, so she wanted to treat it like a slumber party in hopes that it would make it seem like an adventure. This was a common tactic the mothers used during the storm to distract their children. Although their home had not flooded in the prior two events, Amy was closely tracking the weather reports. She was a devotee of the website Space City Weather, and she was worried. She woke up about 6 a.m. and immediately peered outside to see the water level. It was high, much higher than she'd ever seen before. Her stomach clenched. She stood and watched as the water crept up to the bottom of the swing in their front yard. A switch of certainty flipped inside her. They were going to flood. There was no point in watching and angsting. They should act. Amy woke her husband, Mark, and they frantically elevated everything they could and then woke up the kids. Amy packed go bags for everyone. She took another look at the water level and decided she had time to make everyone breakfast, a real one with bacon and eggs. Might as well use up all the food. After breakfast, Amy pushed couches together to make a pen and told the kids to stay there. The kids were thrilled to have a movie put on as they didn't ordinarily get screen time in the morning. That excitement was in stark contrast to Amy and Mark's increasing panic. As water started lapping over the slab of the front porch, Amy decided it was time to talk to the kids about what was about to happen. We're going to get some water in the house, she said. It's okay, and we have a plan, but water will come inside. About 10 a.m., water started flowing into their home from all directions at once. Amy had imagined that it would come in through the doors first, but it bubbled up through the slab foundation across the whole house at the same time. It wasn't as fast as she had imagined, but it was relentless. It sounded like a witch's cauldron, boiling and hissing. It was not going to stop. When the water was about an inch deep, she and Mark got rain boots on everyone. Then, as they prepared to leave for next door, which had a second story, they stood in a circle and prayed. Amy wept as she described the scene to me. We all held hands and we said, this house is not our home. We're our home. This is the important part. As they left the house, wading through waist-deep water in the neighbor's house, to the neighbor's house, with Mark carrying two kids and Amy carrying one, Amy saw something she'd never seen before. Bugs and lizards, dozens of them, were clinging to the sides of the house, trying to get away from the floodwater. It looked like a mass critter exodus. She couldn't believe how many critters were climbing up her house, but she found some commonality with them. I saw two spider mamas with their egg sacs. Their egg sac is like tied to their backs and they're climbing up the stairs and I'm not a fan of spiders, but I was looking at it and I'm holding my youngest and I was like, I get you, I get you. We're both doing the same thing. Get these babies out of the water. Amy's story illustrates how the mothers took charge during the flood. In listening to their stories, it was clear that they saw the responsibility for their family's well being as belonging to them. The mother's adrenaline ran high during and immediately after the flood. In the first few days of the recovery process, their husbands took time off of work and helped remediate the house. Once they went back to work, however, the job of recovery fell almost entirely to the mothers. Determined to restore their domestic culture as soon as possible, the mothers threw themselves into the work of recovery just as intensively as they managed their children's lives. Several chapters in the book chronicle the recovery process and the toll that it took on mothers. Today, I will just briefly touch on those themes. During and immediately after Harvey, the couples in the study largely pulled together and were on the same page. As time passed, however, reality began to set in and the relationship harmony broke down. Although during the initial interviews, mothers reported being on the same page with their spouses. In the follow-up interviews, the mothers reported a variety of conflict within their marital relationships, including conflict around what to do at the house, whether to stay in the neighborhood or move, finances, and the speed with which the couple needed to make decisions. Compounding the conflict, 
were the couple's temporary housing arrangements, which caused stress due to longer commutes, smaller spaces, and then special challenges if they were living temporarily with family. The mothers grew increasingly angry about the uneven division of labor in the recovery process. The mothers, already taxed by the demands of work and family life before the flood, essentially added a second full-time job to their lives. Many different women used that same phrase to tell me what it was like, a second full-time job. All of this took a mental and physical toll on the mothers. In the follow-up interviews, they talked about lots of different types of health impacts, weight gain, stress-related illnesses, and depression and anxiety. A year after Harvey, most of the mothers were settled back into their renovated homes or in rentals while they rebuilt on their existing lot. They had shepherded their families through a terrible experience and come out the other side. But they had sacrificed their own well-being to do it. And by staying, the mothers seemed to be implicitly agreeing to undertake the recovery process again. Despite the chaos and stress of the recovery year and their worry about their children's well-being, just like the choice of the neighborhood was driven by their mothering ideals, the mothers argued that their choice to stay was also made on behalf of their children. The mothers who opted to stay in Bayou Oaks undertook extraordinary measures in order to do so, because the choice of neighborhood and school was such a core part of their family life and identity. Most of the mothers who left did so reluctantly and maintained social ties with their former neighbors. Everyone who left was a repeat flutter, and six of the eight no longer had children attending Bayou Oaks Elementary, so they felt less hold to the neighborhood. Those who stayed articulated one or more of three primary accounts about the choice to stay. An account is a narrative constructed to explain some behavior that people believe may be evaluated or judged by others. The mothers in my study understood that staying in Bayou Oaks was a decision that would need justification to the outside world, and they were ready with their accounts. First, some mothers said that they had no other financial option but to stay, by which they meant they were not willing to take the financial hit selling the house as is would incur. Others said that the entire city was vulnerable to flooding, so there was nowhere truly safe to go. But nearly every mother also cited the strong Bayou Oaks community or its schools as the primary reason they stayed. The community was still strong in their eyes or even stronger than before, as some mothers told me. And they were still zoned to the same schools. Bayou Oaks Elementary was being rebuilt and it would be better than ever. While they worried about future flooding, which I'll talk, to, talk about in a moment, and did not want their children to experience it again, on balance, they believed staying in Bayou Oaks was the smartest decision for their family. The families had several options after the flood. All of the mothers had flood insurance, which was required on homes with mortgages in the Bayou Oaks neighborhood. They could sell their home as is for a substantial loss and move on. They could take the flood insurance payout and renovate. They could pay $250,000 to elevate their existing home, or they could tear down their home and build a new one up high, although that would massively increase their mortgage debt and their property taxes. Mothers who renovated and moved back in, Mothers who lifted their homes and mothers who chose to rebuild all tended to explain that financially what they chose to do was really their only option. Their accounts emphasized the financial soundness of the decision, or if not, that whatever they chose to do was the least bad option. None of the mothers who flooded for the first time during Hurricane Harvey chose to lift or build something new or tear down. Instead, they all decided to renovate. They didn't think it was necessary to lift their homes because they believed that their risk of future flooding was low. Didn't make sense then for them to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars when they could just do their renovations using the insurance money. Regardless of what they chose to do, many mothers told me they felt trapped financially. For Emily, a 39-year-old mother of three, making the choice to tear down and rebuild was their best option. Yes, it is way more than we ever wanted to spend on our home. And yes, we're going to be what people call house poor. But in the end, it's the best option for our family. And we will have this home forever and ever 
and ever and ever. Like we will never leave. The second account of why families decided to stay in Bayou Oaks was an interesting one to me. Essentially, it was everywhere floods. If the risk of flooding in Houston is high, they reasoned, why would they pick up and move to a different neighborhood that might be just as likely to flood in the future? Setting aside the fact that large swaths of Houston have never experienced home flooding, it was true that many of the neighborhoods near Bayou Oaks experienced flooding during Harvey. So when they say that everywhere floods, what they mean are that the nearby neighborhoods they find acceptable with good schools flooded too. As Melissa, 39, mother of two, put it, and it just is almost like if you start looking at, okay, let's move someplace else that doesn't flood. Okay, where are you going to go? Amy agreed, scoffing at the idea that anywhere in the city was safer. This flood is different because so much of the city was affected. So like where? Where do you think, like, where are you going to go for this kind of storm? It's like, give me a break. First and foremost, the mothers who stayed gave an account of staying that was centered on the schools and the community in Bayou Oaks. Pamela explained that her family was staying for schools. We did explore the option of like moving to another area, but it didn't make a lot of sense. We moved there for the school, you know, and like looking forward, middle and high schools, it's a good place to be in. Even if there were another flood, first time or first time flooder Nicole said her family would stay at least while her kids were in school. We would still stay here, yeah, unless both of the kids were in college. After that, you know, we might move somewhere that didn't need school zoning. I mean, that's really what it is. As a byproduct of moving to the neighborhood for the schools, the mothers discovered a community. The pull of that community was strong. They'd been through a lot together and whole family friendships arose amidst the playdates and PTO meetings and little league games. Most of the mothers though, like Kelly, were aware that it would be difficult for outsiders to understand. Nobody will be able to understand it because you think, well, I, you would think everybody's gonna just flee and they're not. They're just like, oh, I'm gonna stay no matter what, you know? Like we're staying. We're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars putting money into a 1500 square foot house so we can stay in our community. Sarah agreed. The thing that's crazy though about Bayou Oaks is that this neighborhood has always flooded. It's always flooded and yet people still want to move here because of the schools and because of the location and because they have short memories and they think they're making a good investment. For Jill, a twice flooded mother, each flood cemented her family's desire to stay rather than eroding it. It would take a ton to move us. We love where we are, we love our community. And you know, each time one of these awful, terrible things happens, it makes us want to stay more, not less. The mothers, to my initial surprise, were divided on whether they thought their homes would flood again. Many of the first time flooders believed the risk of future flooding was low because they had not flooded the prior two neighborhood floods. Although this may sound counterintuitive, it closely matches what science has taught us about risk perceptions. We rely upon past events to gauge our current risks, assuming that future events will be similar to past events. And this linkage is stronger for more recent events. And after three floods in three years, the mothers had past events readily available to help shape their risk profiles. Although this research is useful, Humans do not formulate their ideas about risks in a vacuum, but rather are influenced by a number of social and environmental factors. The neighborhood social circle definitely played a large role in helping the mothers weigh their individual risk of flooding again. And the general consensus was that if you'd only flooded during Harvey, you were probably going to be okay in the future. Michelle, 43, mother of two, summed up what many of the first timers told me. I mean, it's probably really Pollyanna stupid of me, but I, I do feel like there's some, I do feel like it's kind of a fluke. Like I do, I do. And for it to hit again and, and right here and all, I mean, I just think the likelihood is low. Let's put it that way. The multiple flutters felt differently. Ruth, 36, mother of three, was a three-timer. They were waiting on permits from the city to start their new build when Harvey hit. So the family was living in a rental, which also flooded along with their empty home. She had some stark words for the first timers. They're effing stupid. 
Ruth and her family were now building a new home, 10 feet up with a boat slip and lifts for their cars. They weren't leaving, they were adapting. The mothers who had flooded two or three times were also intent on adaptation. I'll finish today with one final story. Rebecca, 41, was a twice flooded mother of two who frequently communicated with me about how her family was doing. In January, 2019, 17 months after Harvey, she confessed that the entire family was still sleeping on mattresses on the floor. She had not been able to bring herself to get the beds out of storage. She was planning to wait until hurricane season was over. But when we talked, it had been over for several months already. And May and the start of the next hurricane season was now just around the corner. Their storage unit was still filled with boxes and boxes of household items and keepsakes. What's the point, she said derisively. It's all just gonna get destroyed if we move it back into the house. Rebecca, like many of the other flooded mothers, made home renovation and furniture decisions based on the possibility of future flooding. Out were couches with skirts, in were chairs and couches with legs, preferably metal legs. Out were wood floors, in were wood look tile floors. Out were traditional cabinets and drawers that went all the way to the floor. In were floating units at least eight inches up. As Rebecca put it, I feel like everything's got to be a short-term purchase because long-term, I'm not going to have it. So what's the easiest to take to the street? What costs me the least? What's going to be the easiest to take apart? Like Ikea, they're going to have the same stuff so I can just keep buying the same thing over and over. I know it'll fit. I have a shopping list already ready for the next one. Despite this halfway style of living, Rebecca still believed that staying was the best thing for her children. She had ensured the future of their schooling by living in this neighborhood, and her family and her kids were embedded in the community in ways she felt were important. She did worry about the future, including the impact on her children of living with the constant threat of flooding, but she also believed that the benefits outweighed the risks. In fact, she, like so many of the mothers, wanted to stay for her children. The reason I don't feel sorry for myself is, not to sound like Mother Teresa over here, but as a parent, I cannot put myself first in this situation. So what I would like to do doesn't really matter. What's best for my son, I think, is to stay put. So it's like, which one is worse? To take him out of his community or to possibly put him through a third flood? At this point, he's just like, this is just life, you know? I mean, kids are, they can adapt. Again and again, the mothers told me that there were some practical reasons to stay, like finances, but they still believed Bayou Oaks was the best place to raise their children. The mothers placed a very high value on the neighborhood, its schools, and the community, and they did not want to lose it. In a chaotic, enormous city, they'd found their ideal place to be, the place they felt would give their children the best chance of success, and it would take more than 50 inches of rain to change their minds. The story of Bayou Oaks provides a cautionary tale for policymakers. When families believe that they have found the best place to live, the best place to raise their children, and especially when good schools are at stake, it will not be easy to convince them to move. I explicitly asked the mothers what they would do if they received a federal buyout payment for their home that they thought was fair. They told me they would try to buy a home that was elevated in Bayou Oaks. As more and more communities begin to confront climate change, these types of decisions will become more and more frequent. If Bayou Oaks is any indication, households may not respond as expected to inducements to move. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Uh, it's certainly a fascinating story. Uh, there are a number of questions in the Q&A. Again, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A. Um, and we will probably get to it. If there's a question in the Q&A you like, please like it and it'll move up the list. Um, I wanted to start though, Rachel, by asking you a couple of uh, uh, semi-personal questions. Um, I think you say in the book, I'm paraphrasing, you may not have said it this way, that you really felt called to tell this story. And um, uh, you're a well-known sociologist. Your past work has not focused on storytelling. 
it's been more data driven. So this is completely different from anything you've ever done before. Why did you feel called to tell this story and, and, and how did you feel or, or what was the experience of, of doing it in a storytelling and narrative way as opposed to uh, your more traditional uh, data analysis methods that you might have used in the past? Right. So in terms of why I felt called to do it, I just, you know, after Harvey happened, I just, I just could not believe that this was happening to these families again. I knew, you know, several people who had flooded during tax day or Memorial Day who had just completed the renovations on their, you know, new homes, and then they flooded again. And I just, you know, as someone who is concerned about climate change, particularly for the future of Houston, you know, the long-term future of Houston, I really worry about that. And I thought, you know, one unique angle to tell on this story is the, the impact on the family, like on their everyday lives and on how they think about things. And initially I thought that they would probably move after three floods in three years. So I kind of went in with that hypothesis. And then when I realized I was totally wrong about that <laughs> hypothesis, um, I had the, you know, the, the fun job of trying to understand why they would stay. And then from that point, I just kind of had the hook and that's, that's, what I went with. In terms of why I decided to do this kind of project, I felt like I couldn't answer the questions that I had with traditional quantitative methods. You know, I guess I could have surveyed everyone in the neighborhood and tried to make statistical conclusions, but what I really wanted to know was to understand their rationales and the way they were thinking about their decisions and that kind of thing is just super hard to capture in a survey, which is what I would normally work with, uh, that kind of data. And then, you know, to be honest, Part of it too was I was a full professor, so I, that's you know I'd been promoted to the kind of the top level and um, at Rice, and I felt like I had um, I could take a risk. And doing this project was definitely a big um, scholarly risk, I would say. You know, um, I had some training in qualitative methods in graduate school, but that was a long time ago, um, and so I really had to learn a lot. I had a lot of help from my wonderful Rice colleagues who gave me lots of advice read drafts of chapters and all that, those kinds of things. Um, I also did something that's very transgressive for an academic bill. I, um, I took a creative nonfiction writing class, <laughs> which um, I don't think I told anyone about, but uh, because it's so transgressive, but it really helped me mm. write out the stories that mm. I wanted to tell. And luckily I found a publisher, University of California Press, who was happy to let me uh, tell the stories in the way that I did. And so, um, yeah, that's how it ended up happening. One other semi-personal question I wanted to ask, which is that um, uh, you say in the book, uh, this may be in the conclusion or the methodological note, I don't remember where, that working on this project affected you personally and not always in a positive way. Can you talk a little bit about how this affected you? What, what impact did it have on your life? and how you dealt with that. Yes. Um, you know, each initial interview was anywhere from an hour and a half to I think my longest one was about four hours. And, um, you know, in that initial interview, I think every single woman I was interviewing cried. I'm a crier, so I was crying, you know, while they were telling me about their children and the experiences of, you know, trying to get their children into boats and, you know, all the things that the book goes into in more detail about the evacuations. It's very hard, you know, very difficult to read. Um, so there's a lot of crying. And then when I had, once I had a collection of 10 or 12 stories, I just kept replaying them in my mind after the interview. I couldn't kind of get it out of my head. I was ruminating is probably the right word. I was ruminating on the stories and worrying about the families. Um, and so I got some advice again from some of my colleagues at Rice who um, have experience with this type of thing. This is a common reaction when you interview people who have survived some kind of trauma um, is that it's a very, it can be difficult for the interviewer to hold all those stories in their mind. And so what I would do is I would go for a walk after each one and I would try to kind of work through it. And then that way I could get home and be my, you know, mom and wife self that I needed to be at home. Um, and it was very difficult. The walks helped. And then once I started writing the stories down, kind of getting them out of my mind, that helped too. Um, but it lingers, you know, I don't know. It, it was a little bit hard for me to get through the section and um, even in the talk 
uh, where Amy's evacuating with her kids, it still gets to me um, because I, I'm envisioning her, you know, telling me that story. So yeah, it's a little tough. Um, I want to ask one more question myself, then we'll go to the questions from the audience. Uh, the, the, the thing that really struck me, it's very insightful about the mothers and the way they, as, the, as you put it, curate the lives of their families very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. The thing that really strikes me is the extent to which they, this is my word, not yours, uh, the, the extent to which they rationalize, their, they go out of their way to rationalize their decisions. They rationalize moving to Bayou Oaks in the first place, that it's this special neighborhood that can't be replicated anywhere else. They rationalize that they are urban people, but they want to live in a, a semi-suburban bubble. They rationalize that it's better to stay than to go even after three floods. Um, what, what do you think that says about, about our ability to what 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 is it? Why do they do that? And 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 what does that say about how we live our lives and how we cope with the stresses of everyday life? You know, I, I just I think it's a very human thing. Um, and and one of the things that I love about sociology is that the best sociology tries to explain things that seem inexplicable. And so that's why qualitative methods and interviewing are so powerful because you can understand those accounts. That I was, you know, mentioning about why they wanted to stay. They will tell you, and I think, you know, they made the decision to stay, and and then they were ready with some rationales for me, right, about it because they knew <clears throat> it was going to be hard for people to understand. And sometimes I would even say that in the interview. I would say, you know, when I talk about this project to people who don't live in Houston, they don't understand home flooding. They just can't believe that anyone would stay, you know, in this neighborhood. Uh, what would you say to those people? And so, you know, then I would get those kinds of rationales. Um, and I think it's, it is, what I really feel like I took away from the project is the, the decision to curate a particular life for these mothers. They felt they'd found this really rare thing and they did not want to let go of it. Um, that is just so powerful that it overrode their worries about the future. Wow. Uh, I'll go to the audience questions now. The first one is kind of a, a geographical or demographic question. <clears throat> considering the city of Houston is so large, what is now considered suburbs? How far <laughs> is that from the sea, from the central business district? Outside the loop, outside the beltway, or outside the Grand Parkway? And, and I have to admit that to many people who live in cities, Bayou Oaks would seem like a suburb. Yes. And yet the mothers thought of it as an urban place. Exactly. So that is another fun thing that I've discovered talking about this book with different audiences, um, is that it really, depending on where you live in Houston, your definition of the suburbs is different. <laughs> so, <laughs> your definition of the suburbs is just a little bit further out from where you live. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes. So for them, I think they were thinking the suburbs were sort of beyond Beltway 8. Um, whereas for interloopers, really anything outside of 610, they would probably think of the suburbs. But, but this was a, you know, it, I, really, I could probably write an entire book about just that, right? <laughs> like, yes, right how people think about themselves and their neighborhoods. Somebody must, somebody should do that. We have several <laughs> questions about um, uh, the role of that government did or did not play. You don't really focus on that in the book. You focus on the individual stories. And for many people in the audience that raised the question of what role was, was the government, I'll begin with yep. the first question. It sounds like individual residents are left to make decisions about how to live safely in the face of flood or other climate disasters. Where is the government in protecting citizens? For example, why is the city not requiring no rebuild or rebuild only with two stories and flood ready or something like that? Um, uh, in some, where is the government? So, you know, I think I say in the book, I am not a, um, a flood mitigation expert by any means. Um, and what I really wanted to try to do with the book was um, illuminate why the mothers and the families made the decisions that they did in hopes that that, you know, would be helpful for policymakers. But what was interesting is I did ask the mothers about their experiences with the city or the county or, you know, anything. And they really felt like they were on their own, um, mm. partly because, and, you know, they were quick to say, well, we don't need the help, that kind of help as much as, you know, people in other neighborhoods. We're okay. We have financial resources. We have insurance. We're okay. But there was very little, um, activism within the group in terms of um, trying to mitigate future floods. So only one of the mothers um, participated in any kind of um, planning process um, with the city or the county or something like that. 
um, about flooding. They were all just very focused on their own home mm -hmm. and their own mm -hmm. community and, and mm -hmm. making that right. But they, mm -hmm. they reported very little interaction. Other, you know, the book talks about this more, but other than working with their insurance companies, which was a whole nightmare for them, um, that, that's kind of what they focused on rather than going to mm -hmm. state or local government. Mm -hmm. Right, interesting. Um, well, a, a similar question. Can you talk a little about the role of the, that the affluence of these families and the ability to influence local government decision making in terms of their decision making, maybe specifically address Project Braze as enabling, an enabling factor? This, this person apparently assumes that, that, Sadat, that the pseudonym Bayou Oaks refers to a neighborhood that is adjacent to Braze Bayou. Um, uh, but but I, 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 it sounds like what you're saying is that um, uh, the government role was really not a factor. Uh, um, uh, a future, future projects such as, uh, if I remember right in the book, future projects such as Pro Project Braze did play a role in the thinking of some of the mothers in the decision to stay. Am I right about that? Yes, they were hopeful <clears throat> that widening of the bayou was going to help their neighborhood. So they felt like that, like if there was anything they felt the government was doing that would be helpful, that was the thing that they mentioned, um, but really nothing else. The, the other thing I wanna say about um, their relationship with government was there really was no um, recognition or at least they didn't say anything about the fact that, you know, some of them had received enormous insurance payouts three times um, and, and, you know, being able to kind of say, gosh, does that seem like a good policy to sustain long term? You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Um, but they didn't see flood insurance that way, right? They saw it as something they, they paid for, um, right. which is expensive in, in Bayou Oaks. Yeah, um, yes. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that I got to the question, but they were optimistic about the Bayou widening. Right. Um, yeah. there, there's a, a, an interesting question about whether you inquired about the mothers about their own upbringing and how often they had moved when they were kids. It, because this audience member says, it sounds like they came from families who never moved since they bought their first and only house. Having come from such a family myself, I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe they moved all the time as, as kids and they wanted to settle down. Did you talk to the mothers about that? Yes, I did. When that came up a lot when I was asking them about why they picked the neighborhood in the first place. And many of them said exactly that, Bill, that they had either moved a lot or um, didn't live in a neighborhood that was really conducive to family uh, life as they were growing uh -huh. up. And so they really were looking for that kind of nuclear family dream, mm -hmm. um, suburban yet urban lifestyle. Uh, uh, um, uh. But they wanted but along with that, too, was many of them had grown up in very homogenous communities racially and socioeconomically. And so that was a reason they really liked Bayou Oaks, because the school itself was racially and economically diverse. And they, yeah. they put a lot of value on that. Yeah. Even though the neighborhood residents were not, and as you say, they right. overestimated the diversity of the, of the neighborhood yes. itself, which yeah. is not an uncommon thing, apparently. Very common. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one one factual question. Do you recall what percentage of the homes in Bayou Oaks flooded either in Harvey or in the three floods together? Was it most of them? The vast majority flooded in Harvey. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't want to say it was 100%, but it, it had to be at least 90, 90%. Yeah. Would you say it's fair to say that there is inequity by social class and or race in, in terms of chances of experiencing flooding, not just inequity and recovery? Um, one of the characteristics of this, maybe unusual, is that is that this is an affluent neighborhood that flooded a lot. Um, right. uh, uh, in Houston, is it your perception that that there that there are equal opportunity floods? One might say, or or is that mostly focused on certain socioeconomic neighborhoods? So I think that um, most scholars would probably say that um, flooding impacts lower socioeconomic racial minority communities more. Um, so Harvey was a bit of an outlier just because it flooded so many different types of neighborhoods in Houston. Um, but it is certainly the case, I can say for sure, of course, that it's much harder for a neighborhood to recover um, when they have fewer resources. Um, and there's a whole chapter in the book that goes into the unbelievable amount of resources, social and financial, that the mothers had access to to help them recover. Um, 
but I do, one of the things I am trying to do with the book is to kind of expose that to say, here's what happens in an affluent area when they can assemble 18 different types of resources to help get back on their feet. So in neighborhoods that don't have access to those type of resources, it's of course going to take them much longer to be able to come back. If, if they do it at all. Right. Uh, which in many cases right. in neighborhoods in Houston, uh, repairs have never been made. That's and right. People continue to live with mold and things like that five years later. That's right. Um, you, <clears throat> there's a question about the children. You spoke, you dealt with mostly with the mothers, they were your subjects. Um, but how were the children who went to Bayou Oaks Elementary School affected, do you think, by these repeated floods? Were they, were they beaten down? Were they resilient? Their kids, so it doesn't matter to them as much? What do you think? So that's a really interesting question. And I do get into that in the book a bit more. I've got some very sweet stories. Um, the mothers told me about the kids. I will say, um, it's a little bit hard. It was hard for me to tell how the kids were doing. Some of the mothers were very forthcoming that, um, you know, their kid had some depression, anxiety. One took their kid to a therapist who actually had a dollhouse that was sitting in a pool of water. And because this was a very young child. And so the child was able to kind of play act the evacuation. And apparently that was super helpful. But most of the mothers were pretty um, confident with me that their kids were fine, they're resilient, they're, they're going to be fine. And I think, you know, that may be true, that they may be right about that. But I think part of it is that they were so concerned about protecting the kids that there's a little bit of what we would call respondent bias in how you would report back about they that. Wanted to, they wanted to report that their kids had successfully been protected. Yes, uh, yes. And I can't, you know, I can't say for sure with my data, but but I, I do think that is, is part of what is going on. But the stories, I mean, at Bayou Oaks Elementary, so they had to relocate the school to an old uh, school building. And for those of you who um, are in, particularly interested in the school aspect, I also interviewed the principal of Bayou Oaks Elementary several times and her stories are some of my favorite parts in the book because she's just an absolutely amazing woman. Um, and she was a great leader for them. But anytime it rained, the entire, you know, the whole school, the kids were just freaking out and the teachers would have to say, it's, it's okay. And, you know, the kids would say, is it going to flood? Is it going to flood? And they'd say, no, this is just a regular rain. So it, there was kind of almost like a, a community traumatic response that, that would occur um, during heavy rainstorms. Hmm. Several more really interesting, we have about five minutes left for the questions. Several more really interesting questions here. Uh, one you didn't touch on, but, but that is in the book. Did you find religion and access to their faith homes play a part in the decision to stay? Yes. So I didn't, I didn't really talk about this at all in the presentation. I talk about it more in the book, but about one third of the mothers in the study were Jewish and proximity to the local Jewish institutions was extremely important to them. And so that was a major factor for those mothers um, in term, for, for staying. Um, mm -hmm. But they also had the other reasons to stay that, you know, mm -hmm. the rest of the community, the school, but that was definitely a factor in staying. Um, you mentioned that of the 36 mothers that were your subject, six were non-white. Uh, one one uh, attendee wants to know, uh, did, they, did those six non-white mothers differ in terms of their attachment to the neighborhood mm -hmm. and the values shared when choosing neighborhood? Was that so, did they share that same curated view or, or not? So yes, they definitely shared the same values. They told me very similar things about why they wanted to be in that neighborhood and, and have their children attend that school. It's a really interesting question though, because I'm thinking about the people who left and I think half of them actually were non-white. So disproportionate number yeah. of those Although actually it's, ended it's up a, leaving. It's a pretty small N, as you would say. It's very small, yes. Um, but yeah, there could be something there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you, you do talk in the book about climate change. You talk about your own personal concern about climate change. How did the mothers view climate change? How did they feel about it? And how did they associate that to the experience, their experiences in being flooded? So it was very interesting because it seemed like such a contradiction to me because they all quote, believed in climate change. They, you know, they told me they think that's a real thing. They think it makes uh, rain worse and they think that it uh, imperils the future of Houston. So they were all on board with that. 
but they didn't really translate that to their own individual future flood risk. Right. Mm -hmm. So they would say that, but then they would say, but we're staying and I don't really think it's going to flood again. To be, to be fair, the mothers who had flooded more than once were a lot, you know, sad. No, I shouldn't say savvier. They were a lot more uh, convinced that they probably would flood again than the first timers. Uh, the first timers were very like, ah, oh, that was just a crazy hurricane. It'll never, it'll never happen. Again. It'll never happen again. Yeah. Um, considering that you're talking, speaking of a, a set of affluent families, uh, were any potential forms of aid uh, for them uh, perceived as stigmatizing? Uh, were there uh, were there some that they did not or did not want to accept because they, they perceived it as socially unacceptable? Yes. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about um, GoFundMe. So this is, you know, a site mm. where you can raise funds mm -hmm. for someone who's gone through something terrible. I'm sure we've all seen them on social media. There was a lot of discussion um, in the interviews about people who had used GoFundMes and whether that was appropriate because they had insurance and they had means, they didn't really need any extra money. Um, so there was definitely some judgment that was going on about that in the group. Um, and they were pretty, they were very sensitive about that, um, that topic. It, 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 if I recall as well, another thing you talk about it, along that same vein is there were instances when friends and family wanted to give money and, and the families were reluctant to take it, uh, fearful in part that there would be a quid pro quo at some point. Right, right. Any of the, and I, I do talk about this some in the book, the entanglements financially with family were very fraught. Um, uh, you know, some, some of the mothers were just so happy to accept it and help them, you know, for example, lift their home or something that needed a big chunk of investment. Um, but others, yes, were very wary, would even send it back, you know, say, no, thank you, we're okay, you know, so. Um, okay, we're just about out of time. I'll ask the last question, which is the last question you always have to ask a researcher, which is, um, this is a big departure for you and your research methodology and your, and your approach. It clearly affected you extremely personally. Um, uh, where do you think you're going to go with your research in the future? And how did this experience affect your attitude toward that? It's a really good question. And I feel like I'm at we that point. We finally found a question that you don't have the answer to. Yeah, no, I really <laughs> don't. I don't, you know, and I think it's partly because it's it's very common when people like just finish a book, they don't even want to start thinking about the next one. <laughs> they need a break. Um but I, I've, I'm continuing to do my work on uh, ch child well-being with yes. quantitative tools. I will continue that, but I do feel like I really loved the entire experience of writing a book, even though don't get me wrong, it's really hard. Some days were really <laughs> hard, um, but I loved the experience and I, I am hoping to do a project like it again, although I, I suspect it would be a totally different subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, Rachel Kimbrough, thanks for being with us today. Thank you all. Thanks everyone for tuning in. In Too Deep is available for purchase from retailers nationwide. Um, if you order directly from UC Press, uh, you can get 30% off if you use a particular discount code. Um, we have, for the rest of this spring, we have one more Urban Reads and two Kinder Institute Forum lectures, all of which will be online. Um, uh, uh, the, the last Urban Reads of the year will be on April 13th, when technology historian Peter Norton will discuss his book, Autonorama, The Illusory Promise of High-Tech Driving, which he challenges uh, the, the role that, that self-driving cars will play. We have two Kinder Institute Forum lectures. The first one uh, will be on March, and these are both online at lunchtime. The first one will be on March 23rd with Shinpei Sei, uh, a, 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 an expert urbanist, uh, a global head of cities and transportation policy at Uber. And then on not May 25th, a journalist, Scott Beyer, who, uh, who does the website and, and, and the blog Market Urbanism, will discuss how a free market approach to housing, transportation, and public administration can create more livable cities. You can register for any of these upcoming webinars by visiting kinder.rice.edu for um, free. Again, Rachel Kimbrough, thanks very much. Fascinating book uh, and, and really a, a, a wonderful personal story from you about how you came to write it. So, so thanks again and Thank so long, everybody.